All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Burris. I am the Chief Communications Officer for the Capistrano Unified School District, and I wanna welcome you all here this evening. I'm sorry we're a little bit delayed, but we usually deal with some technical difficulties before we get started, so I appreciate your patience. Tonight, we welcome back Dr. Sina Safaya, um, Celia Quinlevin, and April Sutherland, all from Hoag's Irvine Aspire campus. And we have been blessed by an incredible partnership with Hoag's Aspire program in Irvine um, throughout the last school year and into this one. So we're grateful to have them back this evening. Before we get started, I want to invite Superintendent Vital to share a few opening remarks with us, please. Great, good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. Last year, we launched an incredible partnership with Hogue Hospital to bring support and resources to our students and our families and to open up a discussion on a variety of topics that impact our youth today. So tonight we're kicking off our first Hogue event for 2021. And in a few moments, you'll hear from Dr. Safaya and a panel of mental health experts from Hogue on a topic that weighs heavily on all of our minds. I know for me as a parent, it does. How to best support our young people during the COVID-19 pandemic. 2020 has proven to be a challenging year for all of us. I wanna commend our Capistrano Unified community for the incredible strength and grace and patience you have shown during these unprecedented times. I also wanna thank the team from Hogue for taking the time to lead us in this important conversation this evening. Please enjoy the webinar. I know as a parent myself, I'm looking forward to participating with the over 327 parents and caregivers who had signed up just earlier today. So I'll turn it back over to you, Ryan. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, tonight, we we're doing things a little bit differently than we've done in the past. Um, we've invited Dr. Cena, and we also have, as I said before, um, Celia and April with us, and we really just want it to be a conversation. So um, there is a QA and a as part of this, as part of this webinar. Please put your questions into the Q&A, and we will use those questions to have the conversation and to hear from um, the, the doctors and staff from, from Hoag's Aspire Clinic this evening. Um, and then we will also be recording this so we can share it out in our community. Um, and as we get started tonight, I would just ask that Dr. Safaya um, begin just by introducing himself, and then we will do the same with April and with Celia. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, all the parents, all the staff, all the clinicians on, on the line today, taking part of our busy schedule, especially during this pandemic, to even with the fires going on in our community, to, to take time and focus on the kids. Because um, to say that 2020 has been a impactful year would be a, a gross understatement. But before we delve into that, I just wanted to um, introduce myself. So my name is uh, Dr. Sina Safaya. I'm a child psychiatrist, um, medical director of the Aspire programs at both Hogue locations, so Newport and Irvine. Um, I've been director now for about four or five years in, at this program, have a private practice in Newport Beach. Um, I'm one of the psych and the psychiatrists for the LA Chargers and work with the NFL and MLB as well as the Major League Baseball too to help out some of those players too. And even for those players, COVID's been super challenging. So um, just wanted to express a little bit about what I do and what what we're gonna we're gonna delve into what Hope can provide, especially this Aspire Intensive Outpatient Program, because it's been a vital resource for our community and we've had so many parents and kids give us a lot of validation that. The program has been really beneficial, especially in this acute time of need. Um, April and, uh, and uh, Celia, if you guys want to introduce yourselves as well. Yeah, so I'm Celia. I'm, all, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, uh, one of the clinicians over in the Newport office. Um, my background um, it stems from I originally started working with people um, who experienced um, are victims of crime and human trafficking. I worked a little bit in eating disorder treatment and then transitioned into working with children um, in foster care and transitional aged youth uh, before coming to Hogue where I, I work with the Aspire team. I'm April Sutherland. I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm a clinician in the Irvine um, Hogue Aspire program. And a little bit about my background, I've been working with um, kids anywhere between five up to teens around 18, 19 in an intensive outpatient level the last five years. Um, the last three years I've been CPI trained, which is crisis prevention as an instructor. 
um, with verbal de-escalation and uh, behavior modification, extensive training in DBT and CBT. Thank you all. Wanted to, if I, if I may, I just wanted to um, start with a little bit of a summary of what I've been dealing with and what our team has been dealing with as mental health clinicians. Um, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, to say that, I appreciate that too. Uh, to say that our program hasn't been would be an understatement, would be a misstatement. We, we actually have a little bit of a wait list right now, but we can typically get kids in relatively uh, promptly, um, which is a, is a huge plus. Um, our program has been out around for about four or five years, but more recently, just given the fact with all the social isolation, with all the, um, all the demands and rigors that these kids have to deal with, that they were already dealing with before the pandemic, now it's, it's beyond amplified. And so I have a list of questions that I've been asked a few weeks ago. We were interviewed by Forbes magazine a couple of times and LA, LA Times and OC Register and whatnot, OC Family Magazine, so on and so forth. So, uh, and we've given this presentation to a handful of school districts. And so as a team, we're gonna discuss these, uh, these issues with you guys as, as parents as well. So uh, like we had discussed, if you wanna list a, a go ahead and, um, provide us with questions that we can answer in real time. It's our pleasure to try to answer as many questions as we can this evening. Um, but one of the major questions I've been asked and our team has been asked is how has the pandemic impacted kids? And I would say there's no, no doubt it's impacted the entire world, like every citizen on this planet in one way or another. Um, in our community, uh, despite, I mean, from what I heard more recently, our cases are surging, but we've been dealing with this for six, seven months now. And I was just speaking with the superintendent earlier before we jumped on, and um, there's no doubt that kids are behind educationally, but I would say even more so socially, there's major deficits too. And because that, that social isolation is, is something that's just unnatural, especially for kids of, this age, of all age groups, um, let alone adults as well. So we're all impacted. This is a once in a hundred year situation in, in theory. Hopefully we never have to go through this again. The last time anything like this happened was back in 1918. And right now the trajectory of deaths is around the same as it was back then. And that was the worst pandemic in the last hundred years. So we're kind of on the same scale. Um, thankfully this one may be a little bit less virulent when it comes to uh, mortality, but it, excuse me, it's still as contagious and maybe even more than the Spanish flu was back a hundred years ago. It's something that we all need to take seriously. At the same time, we can't cower in fear. We do need to have some normalcy as well. And that's where the Aspire program, thankfully, is one of the few that, that has remained open throughout the entire uh, duration of the uh, pandemic. And that's, uh, that's unlike some other programs in our community that did shut down and switch over to virtual. And I think all the teachers and clinicians in this room can fully appreciate how virtual schooling, virtual sessions are just not analogous. They're not, they're not the same as, as coming in person. So one benefit has been for kids coming into the program. It's eight weeks, four days a week. And it's been a great benefit to these kids who've been really isolated for all, over half a year now. Um, so that's something that's gonna impact their lives potentially for maybe even years or decades to come. And so we wanna hopefully nip some of these symptoms in the bud, especially if they're having increased rates of depression and anxiety. I would say that as a psychiatrist, I've never been this busy before. Every psychiatrist, every psychologist, therapist I talked to is slammed. We're, we're working way beyond our normal regular hours because we have to and because we want to be there for our patients and for our community. And so I would say this is beyond just a regular health pandemic. It's also a mental health pandemic and it's fueled by the social isolation. It's fueled by a collapse of routines and structure that kids, even more than adults, thrive and benefit from. And there's even more uncertainty for these kids than there was before. Um, right now, every patient I talk to is either in uh, virtual school or switching over to a hybrid school or going in, in person. And you can imagine there's a chance as cases are surging, we may have to revert back to virtual school. So that only leads and, and adds to the more uncertainty that these kids already have as teenagers and as, as, uh, as young adults are going to have issues uh, when it comes to coping during this situation. The school expectations, even virtual, remain high where kids are expected to handle the demands of the academic rigors despite all these COVID restrictions. And I know that schools are being, for the most part, flexible and districts are being flexible, but it's still really difficult for, for kids more so than I would say even the average adult. Um, 
we're getting to a point now seven months into this into this pandemic where we're all developing an element of like what's called disease fatigue like we're all getting tired of this and kind of letting down our barriers letting down our boundaries and that could be another reason why there's there's going to be an increase in cases along with people being more huddled indoors because of the cooling temperature and so we want to make sure that uh, these kids are not being exposed to potential triggers, not just meaning from like their own friends, but even with family members, like parents who are struggling with their own stressors, with the lockdowns, with their own financial stressors as well, because of the lockdown. And so the kids and adults, all of us as a species, we're getting bombarded right now. So we got to make sure that these kids pandemic or not are safe and are in a good place. And that's where we can come in as a team to help out kids in need. And so that's why I feel very privileged and, and even lucky to be part of this program. And I'm very, uh, I, I feel blessed to be part of a program that didn't shut down. And I definitely trust this team. And I feel like they've gone above and beyond to help out our community. So um, more power to them. I, I really appreciate everything they're doing for our team. Want to mention a couple more things before I, I hand off to, uh, to the team as well. Um, we already had a pen, uh, uh, stratospheric trajectory of worsening suicidality and depression amongst our teen population, especially in Orange County. If I don't know if uh, everyone in this Zoom call is familiar, but the, the suicide rate in Orange County is one of the highest in all of the top 20 most populous counties in America. That, that includes adults as well. But with COVID, it's been even more amplified. So for example, the D.D. Hirsch Mental Hotline in Newport Beach, in February of 2020, they received about 20 to 40 phone calls. In March of 2020, one month later, right when the lockdown started, that skyrocketed from 20 phone calls to 1,800 in less than one month. So that gives you an idea of how the community is suffering with all the issues that we brought up today. And we have had a significant increase in admissions, not just in our IOP, but as a doctor who's on staff at Chalk and at Hogue and other hospitals too, when I'm calling around to get kids hospitalized, the wait list is 10 patients plus deep. We're having to ship kids to different cities like LA and San Diego, just to give parents an awareness of what a dire situation we're in right now. So what we wanna do is prevent kids from getting hospitalized and not, be, not having as much reactionary care. And that's where programs like an intensive outpatient program like HOPE can really come through. Um, I can delve into some more issues that we can talk about as well, but I don't wanna to talk too much. Um, uh, Celia or April, if you guys want to chip in or chime in on that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of what we're seeing and probably a lot of parents at home too for the teens is a significant drop in motivation. I know that that has been a theme that has come up quite a lot in a lot of different areas, whether it's related to anxiety or depression, but this really big drop in motivation, especially when it comes to school, um, which is really hard, like Dr. Uh, Sophia was talking about there, you know, there's this expectation with school and trying to stay on top of things as, as you know, normally as possible. But the reality is a lot of students aren't used to this kind of a setup. And I can speak on, I used to work with um, college students who were online students. And these were students that had a hard time being online and trying to stay accountable to their classes and you know show up on time and, and these were adults and so i think that makes it 10 times harder for our teens and let alone our elementary school students and we are seeing a big spike um, as well in struggles with mental health for our i would say 13 and under kids um, and there aren't a lot of resources unfortunately with, with that from what i i can kind of tell but um but I've noticed a, definitely an increase in that. And I think another theme that I see, which I think causes some level of frustration is of course the isolation at home where also a lot of parents are at home having to work. And so families aren't also having any breaks from one another. A lot of times school has been a really nice break mm -hmm. where they can socialize, be with their friends, you know, build those skill sets. And that has been essentially taken away from them. And that's really difficult when it's day in, day out, kind of that same routine being isolated. And yes, there's some flexibility where teens are, you know, hybrid and they're starting to see their friends. But I will say that um, even with that, I still think that there is this dip in motivation and, and 
this struggle to feel on top of school or even feeling like, you know, there, there's a level of organization to it feels really confusing. And I know that happened a little bit more in the beginning than what was prepared for this uh, start of the school year. But I know that that is something that many teams bring up in program. And that's also really hard for parents too. I, I think sometimes there's a, I don't want to say like a, a dip in empathy, but sometimes we forget because it's so routine. And that is something that I know we work with a lot of parents on is how do you kind of reconnect with that empathy for your teen or child who's struggling and try to come from a place of validation because a lot of the teens need that right now and kind of reflecting on the fact that things are really difficult. So I know a lot of times in our program, we work with the teens on trying to validate their feelings and their frustration and motivation and trying to help them reconnect with that so that they can be successful. Uh, one last thing I would even add um, to that I was thinking about as we're going into the, the fall and the holidays, a lot of kids and teens are missing out on, you know, even Halloween coming up is a huge loss for them. And I can't tell you how many teens have talked about our team, well, at least in our program, our kids, where it's like, it's a Saturday this year and, you know, we don't have school the next day. And this is an incredible loss for them um, because it's, you know, for many families, it's a fun holiday. Um, and so I, I'm curious to see how this pans out even into Thanksgiving and Christmas where a lot of times families travel and they get together and that's not really an option right now for a lot of people and so I think this increase in anxiety and depression is only something that we're going to see increase and so I know that's uh, it's a lot to ask for our kids and teens to to just try and be okay with it right now and so that's where we're seeing a lot of the anxiety and depression. Yeah I have two themes that I think um, will be relevant to add something I've really seen a theme as coming in teens, kids, parents, it doesn't matter who you are, the concept of I'm over COVID, I'm over it, done, it sucks. And we can really push the idea of radical acceptance of we need to radically accept that it's going on, it's still going on, and it's outside of our control. Typically with teens coming in like, oh, I'm over this feeling of depression. We can work on coping strategies, pleasant activity scheduling to kind of help cope with that. This is something separate. It's outside of all of our control. So something that can help adults maybe be validating, but also realistic could be we're over COVID, it sucks, and we need to continue to be safe, and we need to continue to live our best lives we can in this realm, adding the word and, but I've really seen that theme, they'll come in and say, I'm over COVID, and it's like, oh yeah, cool, me too, so let's all just, we're, we're over it, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Um, so it's that throwing in the and, and also reminding them that there are other ways around like their day to day that could be improved on. The second part of the theme is some kind of consistency and routine that had been lost. So that's probably directly related to the kind of decline in motivation. These mm -hmm. kids and teens, if they had consistency that was hanging out with friends, um, playing on a sports team that's shut down. It's really important for counselors, teachers, parents to help them find a new routine that fits into this day-to-day -day because we don't know how long it's going to last. So finding that new consistency and reminding them that, look, this is a new consistency and it will change um, and it could change back. We just don't know, which, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to piggyback on what April just said, too. I mean, we got to do our best to maintain these routines. Um, I mean, we're all creatures of habit for the most part. A handful of us aren't, but ma majority of us as human beings do best with structure and routine, especially with children. It's like they're scaffolding. They need that. And I would say right now, it's even more vital than it's ever moved for. S specifically, like the sleep hygiene and sleep routines are completely out of whack right now. And even more so during the summer, now that the kids have to wake up a little bit earlier for online schooling or virtual school that at least they're getting up earlier but even then um, there's more flexibility in general in that regard and that also means that they're pushing back that sleep phase so a lot of these kids are having what's called the delayed sleep phase and then they're still having to wake up early and they're chronically sleep deprived and sleep is not only crucial just for our mental health but also for our physical health I mean it's one of the few things that definitely helps your immune system more than almost anything else and there's no doubt that we need to maintain that routine just to maintain our health, especially during a, a global pandemic. Um, part of that also has to do with maintaining, like April said, now that we don't have 
the sports teams as much. Although I, know, I think a handful are coming back and play, but the majority aren't. And so we got to maintain that physical activity, especially for these younger kids. Um, they need that. They need that not only just for, again, their physical health, but in my mind, especially as a psychiatrist for their mental health. I mean, there's physical, there's, there's literally scientific evidence that proves that even 90 minutes of cardiovascular exercise per week can be as beneficial as medications for mild to moderate symptoms of anxiety and depression. And I would say right now we're all stressed out. We're all anxious. I remind these kids that I'm human too, and I need to practice what I preach. So I'll go paddle boarding at nighttime, much to like their shock and whatnot, but I don't have time as a doctor to work out during the day. So I have to make time for it. Exercise will not make time for you, especially with what we're all dealing with. So I want kids to try to, and adults to try to practice those routines. And you know, another thing that you had mentioned April was about that, that lack of control. I agree, there's not much control the situation, maybe besides some of the social distancing and wearing a mask and whatnot. But that lack of control psychologically was evident when this, the shutdowns first started, when everyone's rushing to get toilet paper. That wasn't because this was like a GI emergency, obviously. It's because we all as humans just want some illusion, even, even if it's an illusion of control. And stocking up on toilet paper is one of those types of strategies where at least you can say, well, at least I did something. At least I'm trying to do something that might make a difference. Although most of us know that that that's not a that's not the top of your priority list. If you had to, you could find something else to substitute for toilet paper. Um, that being said, I'd say the silver lining in all this is that it's giving us some awareness of what we what we how good life was before. Like just the ability to go to a restaurant, just the ability to hang out with friends and whatnot. These are things that we kind of took advantage of, or we took for granted. Excuse me, and. Hopefully looking back, we're going to really, once 2021 comes around, vaccines are into play, the virus itself starts to teeter out. We're going to look back, hopefully, not with a huge smile or a grin on our face, but looking back that we pushed through that. We endured as a species and we I, we will, obviously, this is now World War III, but it doesn't make this whole situation any easier. It's been really difficult for all of us as, as adults and kids. Now I'd say the kids are struggling even more so just because of all the things that we've mentioned. Uh, part of that, before I forget, part of those routines also and this is where we have to walk a fine balance, especially with teenagers, is they are socially isolated. So what do they substitute that with? They're substituting it with social media. Now, social media has its benefits, but as a mental health doctor, I'd say, especially my perspective might be a little bit biased. Um, and so is our teens because we're dealing with kids who are dealing with some acute situations. That being said, there's evidence and study after study and major journals, we're talking about like JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, uh, The Lancet, these are huge journals, one of the most revered in the world that are revealing time and time again, thousand, five thousand, six, seven thousand kids per study, that every hour spent on social media, there's a direct correlation with increased depressive symptoms and uh, um, increased self-esteem issues. And there's another study that showed that over three hours of social media per day, there's a direct correlation with depressive symptoms. So. We want kids to be connected. And if one of those few ways is through social media, then so be it. But I would still make sure that there's still guardrails in place, that it's not a free for all, that as much as we can empathize what these kids are going through, we don't want to just give them free reign to be on social media all day, every day. I had a kid pull out his phone the other day and went to the screen time app, much to his chagrin, because he didn't think I was going to ask that. And I don't think mom or dad even that app was, pulled it out on his iPhone. This kid's on his phone for 14 hours a day. And that's pretty much means every waking hour for this child who's sleeping about 10 hours, eight to 10 hours a night. So it gives you an idea that if you give these ki ki kids an inch, they might take a thousand miles. And because we're, we want to empathize and sympathize with our kids, we might give them a little bit more leeway, but we need to strike a balance. And so I would try to negotiate with these kids to substituting some of that social media time or technology screen time, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it might be, uh, we got to find a way to substitute some physical exercise for that. Um, and that sometimes is easier said than done. But I try to remind them there's all types of YouTube videos right now with personal trainers that are giving out free, uh, free basically advice and free training sessions. All like, I mean, these are professionals that are trying to build their reputation and their subscribers and whatnot, along with all the type of physical activity that we can all employ outdoors. We're lucky except for this fire situation, we're lucky as, a, as Californians to live in an environment that, that is conducive to working out outdoors. So that's something that I would employ as well. 
Thank you all. Um, I just want to remind parents or anyone viewing that you can put your questions into the Q&A and it does allow anonymous questions too, just, just to be aware of that um, tonight. So um, please do that. As, um, as you were speaking, there were a few things that I, that I wrote down. And the first one was dealing especially with the suicide rates in Orange County. Um, I'd worked before in places where we are helping homeless and drug and alcohol addicted. And so I knew that we were one of the most, one of the areas with the most rehab clinics and other places probably in the world right here in Orange County. Um, suicide is often much less evident to people. And really, unless you ask the coroner for the numbers, most people won't know them. So you, you did say that we are now one of the highest when compared to the most populous areas in the country, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and that's been and, an upward trajectory for the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, and I also know that you have all been very busy. And so I, I just want parents to know that it's probably a relief to some of them to know that they maybe aren't the only ones who are worried about their kids dealing with depression or, or isolation or whatever it might be. And so it's not something where they're alone in that. It's, it's something sadly that is very normal, especially as we have um, dealt with the last seven or eight months of this. I know yeah. that these were topics that we even talked about last year mm -hmm. without the COVID perspective, but just in perspective in general for our elementary, middle, and high school kids. So um, this is some, something that is definitely not going away and in some cases has even gotten worse over this last year. So um, I guess the first thing would be to help parents understand maybe what the signs of depression are. What, what should they be looking for? So immediate red flags of depression would be if, if a child brings up active suicidality or they endorse an intention or plan to hurt themselves. That's the analogous to having a bone sticking out of your body and needing to go to the ER. I obviously have parents contact me anyways, uh, but in that situation, we got to go to the ER or call 911. Um, we can also call what's called the CAT team. The CAT team is a crisis assessment team, basically. I don't think that's the acronym for it, uh, but I'll look it up in a second. I, I, it always, it's like a very generic name, but it's an Orange County um, mobile psychiatric team of social workers and nurses, um, case managers and whatnot that have what, what's called LPS certification so they can write involuntary holds if necessary. Sometimes they almost act as like a show of force for a kid who's acting out, but they can also act as a potentially life-saving mechanism um, where parents don't have to go to an ER. They can have that team come to their home and make that assessment. And a massive majority of the time, they actually don't hospitalize kids. But if it's indicated and necessary, then they will. Um, and that's going to be a life-saving measure. So that's going to be if a kid, and the, the threshold's actually pretty high. Um, the bar's pretty high to get admitted into an inpatient unit. Um, that being said, one of those red flags would be active suicidality. Passive suicidality is defined as thoughts of like, I wish I wasn't here. I wish I wasn't alive. Um, I wish I wouldn't wake up, stuff like that. Those are also major red flags of depression, but they, they're not red flags of getting hospitalized. They're not like emergencies, but they can lead to active suicidality over time. So if a child is having a lot of morbid discussions, a lot of dark discussions, bringing up death and suicide frequently, then that, that's something that needs to be addressed. And I want to mention too, as uh, at Hope, we want to obviously accept as many patients as we can, but that being said, some kids are not a right fit or some kids are not acute enough to get into this level of care. So at, at a minimum, we can still act as a resource for our, for our community and provide referrals if necessary. So that's something I want to make sure I don't forget to mention to, to any of the parents listening in today. If you, before, but that being said, some other signs of depression, some clear ones are things like changes in sleep, appetite, a lot, if there's a change in what's called anhedonia or if kids have increased anhedonia. Anhedonia is Latin for basically losing pleasure in different activities. So if kids have lost pleasure and some of the fun activities are doing before that can be a sign of depression if kids are drafting wills which is highly unusual that's that's usually a major red flag if they're giving away prized possessions self-injurious behavior cutting scratching burning these types of things depending on severity may warrant hospitalization if they're becoming more isolative withdrawn if you're noticing a precipitative decline in functioning so things like academic functioning social functioning 
these are things that need to be monitored and taken seriously, meaning you need to discuss this with your pediatrician, with school teachers, school counselors, therapists, and if necessary, a doctor like me, like a psychiatrist. I'm typically like the, the measure of last resort, but sometimes parents want to see me first to get an assessment from a medical doctor too, which I'm definitely happy to help in that regard. And thankfully, every kid that comes to the program, unless they're going to see their, their existing outpatient psychiatrist, they're going to be evaluated by me at least once but typically more often while they're in, while they're in the program. Um, again, if you do notice a change in mood, personality, if we notice a big change in energy, focus, irritability is spiking, sometimes, especially young males, but females at times too, if you notice a lot more aggression, that can be a sign of depression or anxiety, especially males are going to react outwards where females take it out more on themselves. Um, and these are things that that can be red flags and I wouldn't brush them under the rug. Like these are things that need to be addressed directly. And sometimes just having an open conversation and asking questions in an open-ended fashion is a way a parent can potentially get and extract more information out of a kid. Although I know a lot of parents and even as clinicians, I know April and uh, Celia can relate to this. At times it's like pulling teeth. We feel like dentists trying to get information out of these kids. So do your best. And at times you may even benefit having a third party outside of the family, try to extract that information because kids may not feel at liberty to discuss things that are deep seated. On on top of that, a lot of kids are eager to please their parents despite what their behavior might dictate and they don't wanna worry parents. So they may not actually open up to parents as much as they would with a third party clinician. And that could be someone like as a school counselor too that at times can definitely keep us as like a team involved and keep us in the loop too if they're in the program. I would also add just briefly to, you know, I, I think those are, de you know, definitely signs that, you know, when we see decompensation um, of a teen or child, alternatively, though, too, you know, we've definitely worked with teens who are, you know, very high achieving and doing really well where they're filling so much of their time with stuff and they're running themselves into the ground just to avoid those intrusive thoughts. So sometimes even the teens who are straight A students, AP students, varsity athletes, they're struggling quite a bit. Um, and so, the, and that can feel unusual. It's like, well, they, it looks like they're doing really well, but they're actually really struggling. Um, and so I would definitely pay attention to, you know, the mood shifts. If there's just so much focus on all these other things to a level that feels a little, you know, unhealthy, or they're maybe even avoiding trying to even do fun things like spending time with friends or, you know, things like that can also be signs. Um, I know a lot of parents typically also are, are um, <clears throat> monitoring like social media and, and their phones and stuff like that. Those are also really good insights into maybe what your teen might be um, thinking about or experiencing because we've heard quite a lot where parents will find their kids on, you know, Instagram accounts or TikToks that are talking about self-harm, suicide, eating disorders, things like that. And so those can also be things to be aware of if you're noticing trends in like their feeds or even things they're sharing with their friends. It may be sound really subtle, but those can be good indicators too that they may be struggling. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, hopelessness and excessive guilt, those are signs that we really look out for like saying, oh, whatever, it's never gonna get better, or of course I messed this up, or it's all on me, items like that. And then what can be helpful is really using the teen's language while talking to them about their symptoms and any passive suicidal thoughts. Using their language and their words typically will make them feel more comfortable talking to you about those items. So don't feel uncomfortable using the language, just jump in and join in by using the words they're using. And then um, we do have a, a couple questions. So the first one is, what's the best practice for engage for re-engagement? Um, if if it seems like a student or a child is not um, not interested or motivated for school and and doesn't want to try it anymore. I mean, I can start with something and then you guys just chime in. Um, if someone doesn't seem engaged or maybe seems mildly oppositional towards something, I typically like the approach of maybe blatantly pointing out or like that sucks right like this sucks how can we make it better like join it in with a we to kind of maybe not make them feel like they're the problem or I'm the problem it's a how can we make this better or like you know like a customer customer survey like these are the things I like about this what do you think could improve 
kind of help them figure out, okay, I'm not in trouble. It's not my fault, but we're going to work on it as a team to figure out what are the barriers of engagement. Yeah, I think we'd have to, I agree with that. We, we have to piggyback on that and say like, what what is the reason or let's try to find out what the reason is they're not willing to re-engage. Like what, like, is it depression? Is it anxiety? Is it oppositionality? Is it defiance? Is it related to maybe some potential bullying or cyberbullying, something to that effect? Is there a particular reason why they're not willing to come back? I've even had some kids say they feel more socially anxious knowing that there's a camera on them, even despite that there's like 30 cameras on there's 30 little boxes on the screen. They still feel actually more anxious and they've even asked the school if it's okay if they're off the camera. Now there's positives and negatives to that too, which there could be some secondary gain or some nefarious reasons why they don't want to be on camera. Um, like for instance, like <laughs> playing Fortnite in the corner and whatnot. Uh, but um, there usually there is a rhyme or reason. And I'd say for the most part, majority of the time, these kids are really anxious and down. It's not because they're being willfully defiant. Like they want to go to school, but you can imagine Another example of a kid with ADHD already had significant focus issues, issues with distractibility, impulse control. Now it's being asked to sit behind a screen um, for hours and hours on end. If you didn't have ADHD before, now with COVID, it seems like more people are meeting criteria, mm -hmm. especially with the virtual setting. So it's something that, that we need to do some investigative work. And as parents, you're going to do your best, but at times you, got, you may not be able to figure that out on your own. That's why you may need a team to support you or at least an outside clinician, whether it's through the school or through a third party, through a private party that can help kind of delineate what the reason for that might be. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. task reductions can always help, like maybe have them join in half the amount of time before they go to the full amount. And also they can, we've helped um, in a sense, if someone has like social anxiety, put a sticky on their screen so that they're still on camera, but they're not fixated on looking at themselves. Right. I like that strategy. And then you can always get the schools involved with uh, either 504 IP plans if you need to. I think a lot of school districts have been more flexible given the circumstances. So that's something that occasionally I'll, I'll draft a letter on the behalf of my patient that the, that the parent will um, transfer over, forward over to uh, IP meeting or 504 meeting if necessary. And so we got to do whatever we can to Right now, I want kids to know that although education is super important, their mental health right now is, in my mind, the priority. Um, so if they're struggling, if they're suffering, if we need to reduce some of the, the tasks, if we need to reduce, and I had a kid today, the parent told me that they had to get rid of two of her classes, switch off the AP classes just to kind of make this hurdle a little bit easier to jump over. I'm okay with that. Um, and the objective is to make life a little bit easier. Because um, sometimes with these kids, they might see this massive hurdle that they have to jump over. And it's not even worth even pursuing in their mind. They'd rather just give up and kind of like an ostrich stick their head in the sand and just expect this problem just to kind of dissipate on its own. And like we all know, usually that strategy of procrastination typically makes things a lot worse and amplified. So mm -hmm. um, something that we, we want to do whatever we can to make that this easier for them. And I remind school districts, not that they need reminders, but that if a kid's having legitimate depression, anxiety, these are legitimate medical issues that need to be taken as seriously as if they had like diabetes or let's say some kind of thyroid issue, for instance. So that's something that's, that's equally important, sometimes even more consequential than those medical issues. Yeah, I would say even before COVID, we had, we had discussions with PTA and with parents who were actually asking us, how do you help us take air out of the pressure bubble for kids? So in some cases, it was parents doing it to kids. And in other cases, it was kids putting the pressure on themselves. So yeah. there's also the benefit right now of maybe helping people prioritize what is really important and what is not as we move through this um, very challenging time. So another question that we have is um, related to how, um, and it, it, you may have answered it in some ways, but um, how do you help high school teens with motivation at home if they're 100% online? So I, I, have a, I have a couple thoughts. Oh. Sorry, go, go ahead. No, good, you first. Okay, so, so I have a couple of thoughts uh, just in kind of the way I heard the question too. I don't know if it's maybe specifically academics or you know academics and household things because I, I hear a lot of that when it comes to a, our group setting and when parents come and, and we talk about things. But um, I think a, a really important piece is to simplify 
Um, I have found that a lot of times the expectation is to keep things exactly how it was when school or basically when the world was still intact the way it was. And that's not what we're living in right now. And I think having some flexibility and adjustment, and I always say like, go back to basics. So if your teen, let's say has six classes that they're struggling with, maybe we set the expectation and start small and say, okay, how much of it do you think you, you can attend right now or that you can finish um, to build back up to that, um, being able to sit through the six classes or do all of the schoolwork? Or if it's, you know, they're having trouble getting their work done over the weekends, um, how do you break it down for them so that they um, don't feel as overwhelmed? Because what I have found is that a lot, and th this kind of feedback I've gotten in groups from teams also, is that it feels so overwhelming when they're thinking about how much they have to do Additionally, how much they have to catch up on if they're already behind. And so uh, and I know working with them on breaking it down into smaller, more manageable pieces and also taking breaks in between has been really helpful for a lot of teens. And that also translates over to, let's even say like household chores and stuff. And from my experience, a lot of times parents uh, will... Um, give like a laundry list of things to do and I'll see kids just kind of freeze up and they're like where do I even start with this so again going back to basics right now of okay do you want to do you want to clean your room first or do you want to you know clean up the kitchen do you want to start with putting your laundry away or do you want to take out the trash so just simplifying it especially just because there is this higher level of anxiety and depression so so I have found that to be a helpful tool to increase motivation and decrease um, frustration and then it gives an opportunity too to even increase like a reward system or any kind of incentive too which a lot of teens are driven by some kind of incentive and so I think that can be really helpful for changing behavior helping them get done what they need to get done and feeling a sense of mastery too when they have accomplished something and then feeling like, okay, great. I was able to do this. I, I'm starting to build my confidence again in this. And I also now get to hang out with my friends or I get to maybe buy something with this video game or wh whatever, you know, makes sense for your family. But I think those are some tools that I have found helpful um, when just kind of navigating through the motivation piece and trying to kind of work through getting some of the stuff done. I mean, I'll just add a brief thing on shaping. So this, it's a new type of behavior. So you think like, oh, they've been going to school 14, 15, whatever, however many years. Um, but it, it's not the same behavior if it's virtual. So shaping could kind of, kind of what was Celia was saying, provide praise reinforcements to get to the goal, which would be full-time going back online or whatever it is. So we have to think of it as shaping that new behavior because it's not the same as it was last year in a sense. And also make sure that you're aware of the teen's level of motivation and what is reinforcing. So we can't assume or guess what they would like. We need to talk to them about what would be reinforcing for them. Okay. And then what about helping, maybe it doesn't raise the level of depression but what about helping with, with issues of anxiety? So whether it's a student that's returning to school or one that's staying home and is, and is um, dealing with those feelings. Yeah, I would say when it comes to anxiety, it's something that I think a lot of us are experiencing, like even if you didn't have an anxiety disorder earlier, or if you do have an anxiety disorder, it's being amplified given all the uncertainty and all the, the restrictions that we're all facing. So. I mean, we got to make sure, like I brought up earlier, the routines are set in place, that we're having good sleep hygiene, that we're exercising. Again, the, the studies, especially, I mean, this is, again, something that I, I practice frequently. And I remind kids that a lot of people, if they didn't exercise as regularly, they might need medication. So we don't want to just resort to meds. We want to tackle this anxiety from every angle. And as a species, we haven't evolved to have this sedentary lifestyle. Like we just have it. Like our DNA is the same as it was 10,000 years ago, same as it was 100,000 years ago. So back then we were hunters and gatherers. Gatherers we were constantly moving, constantly trying to survive. And now we can just click on a couple, couple uh, things on DoorDash, and all of a sudden you have a full blown buffet in your house. So like we don't have to really work for our, our food anymore. And like we don't have to actually even move if we don't want to. 
And so I, I, I really, really want to emphasize the importance of, of exercise, the importance of sleep hygiene, making sure these kids aren't potentially self-medicating with any drugs or alcohol. At times I do advise parents to go ahead and drug test their kids, even if they're the straight A student and whatnot, but just really, really anxious. There's a chance that they are self-medicating their anxiety with some substances, whether it's alcohol, marijuana, or maybe even prescription pills. Um, so we want to just check that box off, make sure that's not potentially amplifying some of these issues. Um, but it's something that, again, that structure is important. And part of that also has to do with like mindfulness and meditation. That's one actual two week component of our eight week program as well. And it's really important, especially right now to be able to kind of detach ourselves. If we even can from reality, even for a few minutes a day and just focus on, on nothing and just not be so connected 24 seven to everybody. Um, and there's different types of apps out there. I know kids are, you know, some adults are really into apps right now. There's one called Talkspace and then one called Headspace. There's a handful of podcasts out there as well. Um, there's one called Waking Up by Sam Harris that that's almost like a way to practice mindfulness. That's another strategy that I, I would potentially employ along with breathing exercises. Um, and if we need to, once we've checked off all these boxes, if the anxiety is so prevalent, so if anxiety is leading to functional impairment, and over time, maybe even impacting mood and irritability, that's when we may need something like a medication to help out with some of these symptoms. The reason why is the analogy that I draw for kids and adults is, imagine you're in a fight or flight mode running in a jungle from a tiger. Usually the typical fight or flight mode response back in the day when we were cavemen was like seven or eight minutes until you're able to get away from that danger. Now you have kids who are freaking out and adults too, who are in a heightened state of stress and that fight or flight mode for eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So you can imagine over time, that's gonna, you're gonna run out of gas at some point. You can't be anxious that long without repercussions. And that's when anxiety kind of shifts over to depression over time, when you start giving up. It's analogous again to that tiger. At some point when you're running and running, you're just gonna give up and be like, I don't give a damn, excuse my language. I don't care if this tiger is gonna eat me at this point, cause I don't care anymore. I'm just tired of running. And that's when kids start and adults too start giving up. And that's, that's always typically, uh, when I would actually, for me as a psychiatrist, it's always a red flag. When that anxiety starts converting to depression, it means we got to do something about it actively. And we don't need to wait until the anxiety devolves into depression. We can tackle these things head on and hopefully pre preemptively rather than waiting until after the fact when suicidality pops up and God forbid, the worst case scenario where these kids don't realize I want parents to remind themselves when we were young, our time was distorted in the opposite way it is now. As adults, time is flying by in such a rapid way that we look, we just blink and it's going to be 10, 20 years where kids, every day that goes by feels like an eternity. And so in their minds, we're going to be stuck in COVID forever. I'm going to be in high school forever. And so when they don't see that light at the end of the tunnel, they resort to those really potentially dangerous um, outcomes where I want parents to remember too that kids are kids until in my mind until about 24, 25, where that prefrontal cortex finally develops. And that part of your brain, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how fast it develops, is responsible for impulse control, is responsible for executive decision making, is responsible for judgment, which is why a lot of us as young adults and even as teens did a lot of ill advised things, a lot of stupid things. We just weren't thinking clearly, we we're thinking about consequences. And that's something that I want parents to remember that kids have impulse control issues and it's not their fault. This is the way their brains are wired right now until they're older and they may resort to something, God forbid, lethal if they don't see that light, they don't see any hope at the end of that tunnel. So that's something that we need to hopefully catch and nip in the bud before it becomes something catastrophic. What, what all that is the concept for me when I think of anxiety, I think avoidance is anxiety's like best friend. So whatever item, situation, person, whatever it is they're anxious about, if they avoid it or if we avoid it, it creates it to be a bigger, larger, scarier item. So we really coach the teens in program and coach the parents to be okay with task reductions. It's a lot healthier to do a very tiny part of something than avoid it altogether. Um, I mean, another concept and opposite action would be talking about, okay, let's say you are afraid to do the presentation and you're super terrified. So we say like your classmates aren't going to attack you physically. So therefore your actual fear is not justified. So you wanna do the opposite action, which would be go into it 
with a confident attitude, which is easier said than done. And that's why we do a lot of coaching, but it's that concept of if we see or feel avoidance happening really to nip that in the butt, because that could make whatever they're anxious about look a lot different than what it truly is in reality. Um, real quick, I wanted to add, um, I think a big thing that we try and emphasize is trying to be proactive when it comes to mental health rather than reactive. And a lot of times what we do is we see kids come in when there were signs three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, and then all of a sudden we're in crisis mode. So I know we really encourage parents, especially when you're you know, listening to presentations like this, to really pay attention to your children's mental health and continue to be proactive in making sure that they are finding ways to de-stress so that it does not escalate into an anxiety disorder or a depression, because there's so many things that you can do uh, proactively that can prevent a lot of that stuff from happening. Uh, I just don't think those are a lot of typical conversations people have. It's really just like, go, go, go. We've got school, we have work, we have sports, we have all this stuff we've got to get going. And a lot of people aren't slowing down or maybe more so now, but previously not, people were not slowing down to really check those things. So I would encourage parents to really pay attention to that and find ways to just let your kid relax for a bit um, and, and decompress from a lot of the stressors or, or anxieties and check in with them, talk to them about it. Like April was saying, you know, avoidance um, is anxiety's best friend. So pretending that it's not happening or that it's not existing isn't going to help the situation. So it's, it's good to pay attention to that. Yeah. We want to be hyper vigilant as parents without being like helicopter parents. And that's a tightrope. I feel like as parents where I'm asking constantly for for parents to be like trapeze artists. It's like, this is super hard. So I think as a team, we fully appreciate how these recommendations are way easier said than done. But at the end of the day, we got to do whatever we can for our kids. And that's what, if we need this level of care, like an IOP intensive outpatient program of care, that's what we can provide. But I just wanted to real quickly explain the different levels of care, just so parents are aware. So there's inpatient hospitalization, like for instance, like a CHOC or UCI medical center, if you need to go in, kids typically go in for about, let's say three to seven days. Typically it's not more than that. Sometimes if, if the situation is acute, they may need to stay longer. Below that is a partial hospitalization level of care, which is typically five days a week, substitute school, typically anywhere from like eight, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. or so. Uh, and that's, those are usually like three or four weeks long. Below that is an intensive outpatient level of care, something like the Aspire program and other programs in the community. And the lowest level of care is the outpatient level of care, like what I do for like my private patients, um, where I see them in an outpatient setting typically once a month or so, depending on their acuity. So why am I spelling this out is because there's all these different levels of care. I mean, there are resources out there. So like we, we want parents to appreciate that there are resources out there. And as a team, again, we can act as a resource, even if the kid's not a good fit for us. Um, and so that's something that we, I wanna make sure that parents give us a call if they feel like their kid is struggling or suffering. At minimum, we'll provide some advice. At minimum, we'll give some referrals for other programs if ours isn't sufficient or for some reason it doesn't work out. Um, but we're going to do whatever we can. And part of that resource is what we're doing now. Like what we're doing now for, for, for this school district and for our community is called psychoeducation. And it's our pleasure to give this information to you guys because this is, again, part of that preventative care that Celia is talking about. We want parents to be kept in the loop. We want them to have these resources in mind. So when things do get out of hand hopefully it doesn't get to that point but we can preemptively strike before we need to get hospitalized because that that's not a solution that the hospital is literally to keep a child alive it's not to like cure them overnight or anything like that these cures not that i'm even looking for a cure or, or a fix because these kids aren't objects but what we do want is progressive improvement over time and that's not going to happen overnight in a hospital so we want to prevent the hospitalization but it's still there if we need it and thankfully Chalk is one of the hospitals now that does also have a child unit, which we didn't even have until two years ago. So they accept kids under the age of 12, I believe, where up until then only UCI accepted and other like college hospital, other hospitals that only have teen or adolescent units. So we have that resource for kids as well. Okay, I have a couple, a couple more um, questions and then just, a, just some follow-ups too. So the first one is that um, you, let like a case study you um you have a senior in high school who is on their phone all day goes to bed really late to, um has a hard time now getting motivated and, and working in school 
may or may not be failing school. Um, how do you how do you help a child like that? I mean, we have to. If it depends of how de how defined this child would be, because this is a senior. I'm assuming a 17 year old, so you still have a little bit of leverage. As an 18 year old, it's going to be more difficult. Although I still want to remind parents that even if your child is 18 they're still living in your house. So they still need to comply with the rules. One of those rules might be some tech restriction. So whether you need to get into your router settings, whether you need to literally physically take the phone away at night, then that's something that you may need to do. And I would actually recommend that if that, if, if we do come to that point that we allow the kids to have a say, at least an illusion of some control about uh, what time they would want the technology removed from their room, stuff like that. So I would usually ask the kid to come up with a contract, the parents to come up with a contract. We can, as a team or as a clinician, I can act or the team can act as like a third party mediator and hopefully combine these two contracts and find like a, hopefully a nice middle ground. Um, I mean, ultimately kids, I think they forget that these phones and this technology, they're not human rights. Like they didn't come out with mom and the placenta. Like the phone is a, it's a privilege. Same as like driving is a privilege. It can get taken away if you abuse that privilege. And sometimes with kids, they feel like they can do whatever they want. And they need to be reminded, hopefully gently, that they're not in charge, but we do want them to be happy. We want them to be connected with their friends. And so again, that whole trapeze, trapeze artist strategy comes into play here. But fundamentally, I would say the studies do show that technology screen should be removed from the bedroom. Like that means no TV in the room. I would actually recommend no TVs in the bedroom ever. And no PlayStation, no video games in the room. Laptops, cell phones need to be removed during evening hours. That's going to be an uphill battle for some families. But ultimately, these kids need to remember parents are in charge and they do need to hopefully abide by your, by your uh, rules and regulations. And we may need to use, for some kids who are super defiant, we may need to use some positive reinforcement rather than just negative reinforcement. Usually a combination of the two can be beneficial, but it depends on the kid. So this, like you said, this is a case study and it may, it's going to, the, the recommendations would be predicated on like how this kid is wired and how compliant they are, how willing they are to, to follow through with some of these, um, these uh, potential rules and then the potential consequences if they don't follow through. So that's one strategy and there's many others. I don't know if you, uh, the rest of the team wants to, to chime in on that. Yeah, I would say something that um, is really important is for parents to model a lot of this behavior. So if you're not wanting, let, let's say your, your teen or whatever, having technology in the bedroom or TV, it, like also modeling that as a parent, because then you set the foundation that this is the expectation of the family. This is not just a you thing. And, and, you know, reality is this also gets tricky for the, those parents who have siblings of different ages. You're going to get some complication with you got a high schooler, a middle schooler and an elementary school kid. And there's a lot of frustration that starts to build. Well, why does, you know, my high school brother or sister get to have their phone? Well, that's going to be a little different too. So there is going to be um, a little bit of a balance and kind of figuring it out with that. But I think if you, you know, can model um, for your child, the behavior that you want to see, that can be really helpful because I often hear a lot of times, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, teens will bring up, well, I see my parents on the phone when we're at the dinner table and okay, mind you, they may be doing work and business, which is a little different than scrolling through Instagram, but it's still, it doesn't matter to the team. They're still seeing that. So maybe just trying to work your best on trying to model that behavior so that that becomes the expectation. I mean, ultimately yeah, screen, go ahead. I was just going to add the idea of like a lease agreement. So if the technology piece is a problem, kind of to gently remind them it's earned and not earned, it's a lease agreement. Like if you follow these guidelines, your lease is solid. If not, you're not going to get that lease the next day, that kind of thing with any kind of technology. And then also just trying to figure out, do they have a goal and then work with them on that goal and try to tie in the things that are going on right now into their goal to kind of help that motivation piece. Yeah, I mean, I was going to piggyback on what Silly was saying too. Uh, I mean, screen time is screen time. So these kids won't really appreciate if mom or dad are like doing work. And especially like, let's say like uh, mom and dad are like having the iPad out or working during like at the dinner table. Like that's not the example you want to set for your kid, especially a kid who's having, let's say some tech or screen addiction issues, which is a legitimate issue. Like the World Health Organization, a couple of which I know they've been disparaged recently with, uh, with COVID and whatnot, but pre-COVID days, 
they had like I think it was maybe a year or two ago they had uh, they had indicated that uh, video game addiction, screen addiction, is a legitimate mental health disorder, which I've known and our team has known for a long time. Um, it, it activates the same brain centers as different types of drugs and alcohol. So the reason I bring that up specifically is it's analogous to parents knowing that their kid has alcohol issues or has an alcohol abuse issue, and they're consciously drinking in front of their children, like at the dinner table, knowing that this is a terrible model or precedent to set for their kid. Like you got to practice what you preach. Um, and you have to, as a parent, you are their, their role model, like whether you like it or not. So we have to, unfortunate times as adults, we have to make some sacrifices for our kids. And this is going to be one of those potential sacrifices. Okay. And um, another question just about how virtual learning is impacting students with ADHD. Are there some ways that we can support and help kids dealing with those issues? I mean, ideally with those kids, if they don't have any significant health issues or they don't have any, let's say, older grandparents or parents with or family members with some health issues, I, I would like those kids to get back into regular schooling or at least some kind of uh, hybrid model because realistically that virtual setting is gonna be really difficult for them to focus. It's just, it is what it is. Um, and it's something that we have worked with different school districts when it, whether it's an IEP or 504 plan to find some flexibility to maybe even have like a, I think one, one parent was thinking about having like a one or one-to-one -one aid come to the home or maybe even be in the Zoom session to be keeping eyes on the kid to see how distracted they are. That's one potential strategy. Um, but this is something that I've been dealing with with a lot of with a lot of patients and their families. And it's, it's an uphill battle. Like, I mean, again, these kids are already had tons of issues focusing in class with a lot of supervision and even like reduced class sizes and whatnot. And some parents, if they can afford it, they may need to at least for the time being resort to, to tutoring, more tutoring. They may need to resort to even going, there are some schools that have one-on-one -on -one training, which can be really cost prohibitive for a lot of families. So it's, a, it's not a viable option. But right now I'm trying to, I'm pulling my hair out trying to figure out different ways to help these kids focus better. Because even again, kids who didn't have ADHD are having significant issues with distractibility and, and focus in general and even procrastination. Cause right now we have all types of excuses that we can come up with tonight to not get work done. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I would also recommend and, and we've answered it a few times in the, just um, as I'm typing in the Q and A, but if you're noticing some issues and, and you need to reach out to the teacher, then you have permission to do that. So um, communicating with your students' teachers is really important. Um, let them know what's going on with, the, with your child and maybe even with the family, the challenges and the other things that you're seeing and open up that line of communication. It's really important because then they can begin to figure out how they can support you in supporting your child. Um, and if that doesn't work, and if you need more support and you feel like you're not getting it, you could also always reach out to the principal in order to mm -hmm. get some help. So I would just recommend that. Um, those are always options. And typically the first things that we ask when parents contact us directly at the district office is, have you talked to your teacher and have you talked to your principal and how can we help you do that? So yeah. very important in that case. The teacher often does not know the full, the full story of what's going on with um, children. So it's, it's great to have a conversation with them about that. Yeah. I'd say the squeaky wheel gets the grease and most things in this life. So uh, without like taking that overboard, you want to, uh, as a parent, be vigilant without being like, hyper vigilant and just making sure that the teachers kept, I mean, huge majority of teachers, like, like us clinicians, we want to help these kids. So like the more information we have, the more we can potentially do something about it. If we're kept in the dark, like for instance, as a doctor, I may not hear about like a kid's suicide attempt or like their symptoms until way after the fact. And I tell these parents, I was like, you actually have direct text access to me as a physician, which is very unusual. Why did you not utilize that resource? And they're like, oh, I don't want to bother you. I'm like, it's not bothering me. Your kid attempted suicide. Like I need to be kept in the loop with these things because I need to, to just to help as much as I can without having to send your kid to the hospital. We want to, like Celia said earlier too, and April's been discussing it myself, we want to, we want to be preemptive. And so by not just for their mental health, but part of their mental health is their education. And if, as long as you're keeping the teachers in the loop and the administration of your school in the loop, you're more likely than not going to get assistance. So I would, I would 
I would pursue what we're all talking about because ultimately if, if these things aren't brought up, then we may be kept in the dark and not even know that it's an issue. Yeah. yeah. Something to add, if, if there was something on a plan that was working pre-COVID, the parent could probably email or let the teacher know like, oh, hey, look, like last year, my kid got their planner checked at the end of the day to make sure they wrote everything down. Um, if the teacher this year didn't know that, maybe just a gentle reminder to make sure that is replicated in whatever way it can be. Okay. And then a few follow-up. Um, is therapy that you're providing, in, is it virtual or in-person? In-person. Yeah, so our, our program is totally in-person right now. We're actually trying to get some clear masks approved um, because we want these kids to be able to pick each other's, uh, and for the team as well, to pick up affect, to be able to emote better. It's just better for socialization. Um, so that's something that the foundation supposedly is going to back and maybe even give out free these high tech masks to every kid that's in the program. Um, I'm very, I'm, I feel so lucky. And I actually, I pushed this hard with the, the chairman of the hospital and like, we cannot shut down under any circumstance. Like we just can't do it unless there's literally no other option, especially when we're talking about 96 hours of treatment over eight, over eight weeks to, to really set some of these coping skills and strategies to, to leave an imprint in these kids' mind. It's just not going to be as effective in a virtual setting. And the way these kids actually benefit from each other as well, it's just not the same in a virtual setting. I know the teachers and the other clinicians in this, on the Zoom uh, line totally appreciate that. Um, so I, in that regard, I think we're actually one of the only programs I did stay open the whole time. I know that the Aspire program at Chalk and at Mission, they shut down for a while and their census dropped dramatically because parents and kids just aren't interested in going to that type of program. Now, that being said, Everyone is required to wear a mask. We did cut down our census. Uh, we have switched over the parent training sessions or the parent, the parent family sessions that usually was going twice a week. We've cut that to virtual sessions for parents alone, um, which they still find very helpful. And the parents aren't our patient compared to the kids. So we're, it's not as much of an issue, um, but the, I've had so many kids even more than before saying they love the program. And one component of that is because it is in person. So I'm, I'm glad that Hogue didn't, um, didn't cower in fear. And I think it's been, it's been observed uh, by the community. So like Representative Ruta and Senator Morlock and other uh, state and, and US representatives have been actively involved in what we're trying to do, whether it's like getting contracts with Medi-Cal, whether it's working. Well, we had a community forum, a mental health forum not too long ago that was actually started off by Dr. Drew, uh, Dr. Drew Pinsky. And so it's been nice to be part of all these different organizations, whether it's school districts like you guys, which we definitely appreciate um, this partnership, whether it's with different types of uh, localities on the US level, on a local level, um, like on a county level or, or city level. Um, and then again, like just doing this as community outreach for us is really rewarding. So we're happy to help. Um, so whatever, whatever you guys need us to come back, we're willing to come back just because we, we want to get this information out to as many people, as many parents as possible. And then um, there's also feedback that most therapists and psychologists have are booked. And so what recommendations would you give for parents in order to find something for their children? I would, uh, I would, if they haven't already call the insurance company, get a full list of providers, whether it's therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, I'd also go to a website called psychologytoday.com. Uh, that's a resource that's basically every, it's, a, it's one of the biggest directories in the U.S. Um, for various different levels of mental health clinicians. You can click on different filters for if you want like a child specialist and a therapist versus a psychiatrist, if they accept your insurance or not. Right now, even cash doctors are, are slammed right now. So, but their availability is probably a little bit better than insurance doctors. So if parents can afford it, they may need to find a cash doctor instead and they can likely get in a little bit sooner. Our wait list right now is I believe a few weeks out, so it's not horrific. Um, so the sooner parents contact us, the sooner we can get the kid on a wait list. And at minimum, we can provide other referrals if we need to. So we have, like I have maybe a referral list of 15, 20 therapists that I refer out to. I'm assuming at least a handful of them are accepting patients, um, but it is tough right now. I hear this almost every appointment or every day where parents are having a hard time finding clinicians that have availability. And that just has to do with the demand supply curve and how a lot of people are struggling. And I, anywhere that you would call, I would advise to put your name down on a cancellation list because in mental health, there are a lot of cancellations, even last minute. And because a lot of sessions are virtual, 
it may be easier for a clinician and a, and a patient or a family to connect compared to before COVID when they'd have to find the time to come out to the, uh, to the clinic physically. So that's another thing that could be a way to hopefully get in sooner than later. I, okay. I would also add a, a couple things real quick to that. Um, <laughs> one thing that is helpful with psychology today um, is you, what I recommend is copying and pasting what, you know, what your little message or email is because you can connect with the clinicians and find a, a bunch of them and copy and paste that and send it to like five to 10 of them because that will also save you some time on just trying to call and you'll see who responds True. back to you. It saves time. You can connect with a bunch of different people. Also, it's really nice with kind of going along the lines of what Dr. Cena said, because a lot of therapists are doing it virtual now. And since most clinicians can practice anywhere in California, you can look outside of, you know, just your city too. Yeah. So Orange County is pretty big. So even if you lived in, let's say St. Clemente, you could work with a clinician in Anaheim. It doesn't really matter. Um, it, as long as I would say it's appropriate to do the virtual therapy, because I would say most clinicians are, but that, that could be potentially an option. And I have um, made that suggestion to some families and that's been really helpful. I, I even know some people who work with therapists up in NorCal too. So again, it depends on the situation. Uh, of course, you know, if there's severity and, and things like that, but if it can be appropriate or just for your team to talk to someone or even for parents too, I really encourage parents to also seek out therapists as well. It's great to model that for your team that you're also talking to someone. Um, and also I've noticed a lot of parents are so busy taking care of everybody else. They forget to take care of themselves. And so um, it's really helpful to seek out a therapist as well so that you may have someone to talk to or just have a sounding board and you know maybe to vent about the frustrations going on with everything um so those are a couple things that are helpful and then the other part too uh, it's it's really great to ask your insurance if they'll even six, uh, accept super bills um some clinicians can provide that so if they're out of network they may be able to cover some of the cost for you um so that's something else that um, can be beneficial if you're struggling to find a clinician in, in network so. okay and i'll ask one more question before we finish up but it has to do with something that we talked about earlier and and i forget who mentioned it but the idea of radical acceptance unpredictability and the loss of routine so um in a case of say where a child's motivation for school comes from something like um, visual and performing arts or music or physical activity like athletics or PE, um, how can you help them where maybe a school district, like for instance, for us, athletics is still just practicing, there are still no games and even that was limited when we first opened school um, heading out of summer. Um, virtual performing arts is still an issue with us or using wind instruments in, in indoors or outdoors at this point is highly restricted. So how can you help parents sort of build that routine and those coping skills, sort of like what you said, scheduling pleasure before um, for children who need that and who maybe aren't getting it? I can talk briefly on like um, the athletics part and PE. Um, the first step, though, is radical acceptance. If the teen is not accepting the situation, it's going to be hard to any like any change behavior to occur. So once they accept that it's not the same, um, something that could be fun for a team to do is on top of practicing, they could come up with athletic challenges that they do on their own and they share on some kind of group thread or come together and talk about it like athletic challenges, squats, push ups mountain biking, something else, because being part of a sports team and athletic, it doesn't just have to be doing the sport that you do. So you, I think really radically accepting that it's not going to be the same and then coming up with other ways to be active. Also to still do some fun. I mean, this is more theater and drama, like fun role plays or games virtually just for a small cohort. I would try to make it pretty small. Um, so they're still getting that out. Um, and if the parents are comfortable finding like a few teens in their bubble that they can meet at a park and practice some of these items they've been working on maybe throughout high school. But yeah, for sports, I would say it's, I've played sports all my life. I'm very competitive. Typically athletes are competitive. Something that could help is having them have challenges and it could be individual tasks 
but then to talk about it weekly, like kind of compare and contrast where everyone's at. And I know that we, our PE has been moved to virtual, but we still require activity logs. So there's still a way for parents at least to help make that a routine of the day and then report it back to um, the PE teachers as well. And if it's safe, they could go out and it could be like walk a mile and let's see who can have the coolest picture of where they went. Like make it a little more interactive. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, as we close, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Cena um, and the team. Um, we always appreciate you making time out of your very busy day and evening to, to help us. And, and this has been very helpful. I know even in the comments from parents saying that they are thankful for this and help and that it's helpful. Um, and so we look forward to doing more of these in the future. And so um, with that, as I said, we did record this, so we, we, we will send it out as a community message with a link so that our families have access to this. And as we close, I would just say um, maybe the team can end with some ways that parents can help sort of take the pressure off of themselves and ways to do their own self-care too, if you have any quick suggestions as we close. Yeah, I would advise that parents remind yourselves that you're human too, and you're going through a pandemic as well. Like this is not normal. Like we're all, we're all in this fight together. We will get through this together. It's not. This is not World War Three. But at the same time, it doesn't that, that doesn't make it any easier to to tackle individually. So we need to find ways to to take care of ourselves. And if that means exercise, if that means occasional date nights without the kids present, um, setting up outings, setting up vacations that are that are COVID friendly and whatnot. Um, and like we had brought up earlier as a team, like if sometimes parents, they get caretaker burnout. Like they, they need their own support. Kind of like when you're on the airplane, you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first if you want to help out your child. That might indicate seeing your own therapist or even psychiatrist if necessary, because again, we're all stressed and we need to take care of ourselves if we want to take care of our children. Something that I remind myself and I remind our team as well. And they even remind me sometimes Dr. Cena, did you make sure you, did you eat today? Make sure you're exercising, make sure you're taking care of yourselves, doing things that you enjoy, because we all need to, we all need to do that, especially if we want to take care of children that, that are suffering. Um, I, I would add to connect with other parents. I'm sure many people are struggling with similar thoughts or feelings. So if you have friends or, you know, trying to connect in small groups, whether that's, you know, again, like a COVID friendly hangout or a virtual, you know, meeting, whatever, you know, works for you. I think that that can be really helpful just to not feel alone. It's similar, like how we have our teen groups, you know, parents need support too from parents. And so I think even just reaching out to your own community can be really helpful and, and doing mm -hmm. some, you know, nice things for yourself. It doesn't have to be something that's, you know, hours on end, even just finding at least, you know, an hour a week or something that you can just kind of decompress and do whatever you need is super important. Yeah, the last thing I'll add is just asking yourself that simple question at the end of the night of, did I do something for myself today and not mm -hmm. feel bad about it, but really highlight, did I do something? If it went well, try it again later that week. And if you didn't do anything that day for yourself, schedule something the next day and make sure to follow through with it. So make it simple. Okay, and there was one last question, which is where they can find more information on the, uh, the Aspire at Hogue Irvine. Um, so I meant to type it actually as an answer, but hit answer live instead and it wouldn't let me go back. So um, what I did was Google um, Aspire at Hogue Irvine and you can get information there. Um, we, when we send out this link to the, to the webinar, we'll put that information in there to all families so they have access to that. Um, we'll also mention um, in the email Talkspace and Headspace apps. I know Dr. Cena also mentioned a podcast and I didn't get that written down. If he remembers what that one was. Yeah, it's called Waking Up. Okay. And it's like a way to guide yourself through meditation. Okay. I've, I've listened to a few podcasts myself of that, on that series and it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, okay. Yeah. And the, the nice thing about Hogue, the Aspire programs too, are 
we don't have like a call center that parents call and it's like a third party. Like when they call, you're going to speak to someone like April or Celia, one of the other clinicians that works there. So parents start off talking to one of our therapists and they're going to start the entire process with our therapist and end it with our therapist too. So that's like a, a door-to-door type service situation where like they're going to be kept in the loop the whole time. Um, so at, again, at minimum, the phone number that we have, the website, you guys can always feel free to call us. We're happy to help. And we're usually pretty responsive meeting. We'll pick up immediately or the same day or the next day. And so for some reason, if we don't uh, pick up, just leave a voicemail and we'll call you back. Okay. Um, again, I appreciate you, Dr. Cena, Celia, and April Likewise. for being here this evening. Um, we're, we are grateful for this partnership and for the work that you do um, in supporting our kids and our families. And we look forward to seeing you again. Likewise, the feelings mutual. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.